Three hours drive from Ghana's capital, Accra, is a family home located within a residential area in the heart of the coastal town of Keta. There are no distractions. It's training, family time, sleep, meditation, training, and the cycle repeats itself for Isaac Dobby the Royal Storm. Every day has its different schedules for the former WBO Super Bantamweight champion. Isaac Dogwe comes from a decent background and many a child growing in this kind of circumstances would hardly want to go through the regimen of training to become a boxer, but he did. He fought in the UK, dominated and joined Ghana's Black Bombers, the national amateur boxing team. He fought in the Olympics in 2012 and never looked back. He's not from a poor fishing village, he's from a royal family. It's a family marked by faith. They see Isaac's title as a prophecy that's come to pass. And a knockdown score by the Three. world champion, Four. Isaac Dogbe. Dogbe eventually won the WBO Super Bantamweight title and lost it months after one defense. But the descendant of the royal Badu clan of the Volta region of Ghana, who are known for being warriors, is on a mission to reclaim world title glory. He has an arduous task of reclaiming the title from Mexican Emmanuel Navarrete, who defeated him in Texas in a one-sided bout that exposed Dogwe's ill-preparedness. Despite my ill fitness, I was hopeful that I rely on my other attributes, you know, but things didn't go as planned. He was fighting a guy that has a long, reach. you know, reach. How do you fight a guy with a long reach? You have to go forward and put your head on his chest. There's no other way. But then when you, if you have to put pressure on a guy like Navarrete and your legs are gone, you can't do it. Because a fighter like Navarrete needs constant pressure. pressure. You see, constant pressure means that you're doing the picky bull, moving forward, yeah, doing the Azuma Nelson, you know, Azuma's guard, you know, doing that, back, rolling, you know, fighting Navarrete from, uh, from the body. But the kid couldn't do it. So, at, at which point did you realize that this is not possible anymore? I would say from round eight. I mean, because yeah. Isaac was pulling so, back. So after, I'm wondering what you were telling him in the corner, uh, you know, after round eight. So anytime, so he came back around 9, 10, 11, 12. What were you saying to him? He said to me he couldn't see. I see. Yeah, daddy, I can't see because his eyes, you know, he gets allergy. The eyes get puffy, you know, so now he can't see. And I said, oh, my God. But then I said it in a very down tone. You have to survive, son. You have to survive. You can't get knocked out. Don't get knocked out. So what, what, was, what was Isaac running on then? between 8 and 12? I would say, you see, all I said to him, you have to go forward, regardless of what he's throwing. When you go forward, you'll be saved. But when you pull back, you're gonna be, he's going to be hitting you at the end of his shot, full on. <laughs> There's not, you have to go forward. You know, so, but then he wasn't fit. This admission, of the course of his defeat drew great admiration for him purely because he spoke the truth. His father and trainer Paul Dobe also admits that a lot went wrong with the training camp. I was getting this pressure from people, leave your son to whatever. I left him. So that the, 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 the fight, Navarrete's fight, I wasn't invited in the training camp. Sometimes I do that. I, 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 I tend to leave him and then I'll be calling him. Are you training? What are you doing? Did you do this? Did you do that? He's oh yeah, daddy, I'm training hard. This, this, this. But the coach is good. This, 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 this. So, come two weeks to the fight. I traveled from Ghana to, you know, England for us to go to America. We done a long run. 
that we used to do like a three hour run, which we do in um, uh, a three hour run. As it couldn't finish even an hour and a half. You see the whole thing? That was the Navarrete fight. So I said, oh my God, you are not fit. So what do we do? I mean, at that point, there is no chance. <laughs> There's no chance. If you want to do that, then you're going to wick the boxer rather for the opponent to come and destroy it because you have to rest in that period. A week and a half time, you have to rest. You can't train. You know, so we had to come back to this sonar business, doing the sonar for him to lose the weight, training in the swimming pool for him to lose the weight. You know, <laughs> it was a disaster, you know. Isaac Dogwe was born on September 26, 1994 and had his education in Kumasi in the Ashanti region of Ghana and then left for the United Kingdom. Compared to other young boxers from Ghana, Dogwe had a privileged background. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, you know. Likewise, Isaac, you know, we, we, we're not like the bad boy type of, uh, you know, people that are in boxing or being, have a house. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? I was raised by my grand grandparents. Okay. And, um, you know, um, when I moved to England, I went to live with my, my father, my siblings, and my stepmother. You know, so there's always, I mean, she's always taking care of me. And, um, you know, through my schools and everything. My grandfather was crying. The time that you heard I was going to the Olympics, you know, you, he he phoned he phoned my father and he was crying on the phone to my father, telling him that what is it that he wants? If it's money that he wants, he should say he send him money right now, today. And look, at times we look back and it's like, no, look, it's not it's not it's not about the money per se, you know, it's about making a difference, doing something that other people in the family hasn't done. You know, you can, you, can, you can achieve so much and you can, you know, through what we are doing, you can make a lot of influence, you can be an influence to so many people. Many a child his age would stay away from the sport of boxing for obvious reasons and Dobby's mum also objected strongly to the idea. As a mother, everyone is, you know, every mom, every, every mom is scared that their, their son is going to get punched in the face. You know, at first everyone was worried, you know, you know what, like, Paul, why are you letting Isaac box? Paul, I can't take this no more. Paul, this is too much for me. Paul, this, Paul, that, you know, but sometimes it gets to a, it gets to a point where, you know, when, you're, when I'm winning and everything, you know, I'm knocking the people out and all sorts of things, then at a time, comes, everything kind of like cools down. Then they start to grow more confidence, you know, because they know that, look, I have my father beside me. It's not going to be there for something to go wrong, you know, so that's the confidence that, you know, the family had in my father. That's why we, we are able to continue to, you know, do what we're doing. So with the decision taken, Isaac Dogbe forged ahead. Coach of Furia Sare is Ghana's most experienced and highest certified in amateur boxing. He has handled generations of Ghana's national team boxers at various international events of relevance. They include the West African and African Championships, the IBA World Championships, qualifiers for the Olympic Games and Commonwealth Games and other international tournaments. He took me through Dogwe's journey into the national team, the Black Bongos. I first saw him when um, Ambassador Rekwaku uh, brought him to justify by then we have some boxes around here and he has to come down also to justify. And there was a tournament, after the tournament, I think he lost to Jesse Lati. Uh, uh, he lost to Jesse Lati, but Ambassador Rukaku was, wasn't happy about it. So um, he, he called me uh, to a meeting 
and we have a whole uh, discussion and it was about who to choose for the uh, tournament and uh, it happened that we have to take uh, Dogbe for the African uh, qualifier, Olympic qualifier. And before then too, we have to train at uh, Roman Ridge for some months. We went to um, Azerbaijan, a whole training period. We went through, but he's a very disciplined uh, guy, doesn't talk much when he was in the national team. And uh, he listened, he take instruction. And I, I, I didn't have any problem working with, uh, with him. And uh, I, I, I saw his discipline that it can take him to where he is now. Isaac Dogbe! The young boxer rose to the occasion when he got the opportunity after he was drafted into the national team through the instrumentality of the Ghana Amateur Boxing Federation's president at the time, Ambassador Ray Kwaku. Dogwe qualified for the Olympics in London 2012 after winning silver in the African qualifying event, beating Mohamed Badir of Egypt, Emilian Polino of Tanzania, and Ayabonga Sonjitra of South Africa, only losing on countback after a 6 6 draw in the final to Abubakar Libida of Morocco. In the first round of the 2012 Olympics, he fought Japan's Satoshi Shimizu. Ahead on points in the first two rounds, 4-3 and 3-2, he lost the bout after the judges scored round 3, 5-2 in favor of the Japanese. This effectively overturned Dogwe's lead. The verdict was met with vocal displeasure from ringside spectators and was later described as contentious and a mystery decision by media outlets. But these stories are not new to the sport of boxing. I would describe it as a very bleak moment. You know, and it's, I'm not the only person that it has happened to. I believe that I may be one of the youngest it has, it has ever, that sort of thing has happened to. I can remember, if, he, if my history serves me right, 19-year-old um, Roy Jones Jr. also lost in the Olympic Games. You know, a man that he severely beat, but then at the end, he gave it to the opponent, you know, and um, these things sometimes it happens. But in my case, it was so horrible um, due to the fact that the people I was with, the people who were um, supposed to be the technical people who were leading the Ghana team, the Ghana Olympic Comite Committee, I think GOC, and the people who were assigned to the to the 2012 Olympic um, athletes, they weren't able to do anything about it, which was, you know, one of the most, um, you know, painful things you can ever, you know, go through. The first two rounds, we thought he's winning. And so the last round, surprisingly, uh, we thought, oh, we, at least we had one, or one and two rounds at our side. So we were, we were pretty sure we are going to win the fight. But all of a sudden, the scores surprised us at that time. Well, uh, it was a, 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 a something that we need to protest about. But at that time too, there is no money because when you are going to protest for such, uh, you have to pay for uh, some amount of money before uh, you, they, will, they, will, they will look into your, your, your protest. And so, so many things, we were handicapped at that time and we couldn't even uh, protest for, uh, for the fight. It was a sad thing. Wide sweeping right hand from Dogbe. Weight world champion, Royal Storm, Isaac Dogbe. But being the warrior he is, Dogbe rose from that disappointment to record win after win when he turned professional the next year. Look at this barrage from the champ. It is over. That is it. A first-round TKO title defense for Isaac. Lawyer Peter Zwenis is the president of the Ghana Boxing Authority. Under his leadership, the sport has seen a boost in promotional opportunities. The administration of Lawyer Zwenis has been a big supporter of Dogbe's career. I watched him consistently during the early stages. 
from the national title fight against George Cramper. Then he demolished all the local opposition, Michael Bano and others. And then he got to international titles um, with um, Evaristo and then Cesar. Then eventually when he won the title against Magdaleno, defending against the title before the Navarrete fight. And um, I can tell you that in all these fights, he kept on improving by the hour. And um, one noticeable trait about him was his conditioning when he came into the ring. Very well conditioned. And he had this trademark start of starting the fight in an explosive fashion. He goes after you, wears you down with a lot of body punches before he gets to your head. And he persists you, you know, consistently across the ring. Isaac's father, Paul, an ex-soldier, decided to devote his time to the development of his son's talent as his trainer at a very early stage. International boxing has told and is still telling some good stories of father-son boxer-trainer relationships, including Jesse James Leia and his son, Floyd Mayweather Sr. and Floyd Jr., and Fernando Vargas and his son Emiliano. The young boxer is very aware of his father's influence in his journey in the sport. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My father had a vision, you know, about me becoming one of the greatest boxers in, in history. You know, he, he set himself a goal, he spoke to me. At first I was like, you know what, nah, you know, this is not for me, this, that, that. that. As a father and as a son, you know, there comes a time when you have to be able to, you know, think to yourself that, look, this is my father. All he wants is the good. He wants the, he wants the good for me. He wants the best for me. So, yeah, let's give it a try, you know. And um, that's how it just started. And, yeah, my father has been very, you know, clinical about it, you know. Sacrificed so much day in, day out. He's been patient. You know, he's been thorough in everything that we've been doing, you know, from day dot. You know, always made sure that I always had everything I wanted. And um, just take my mind off everything else. Just focus, focus on the boxing, focus on my education. And yeah, this is where I am right now. So Dobby sent clear signals from the sound of the first bell in round one of his professional career. He fought between Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and the United States for his first seven bouts and gained good experience as a novice as it was out of his comfort zone of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, John Oblita! The rise to relevance began from the moment he defeated John Oblite Kome to win the West African featherweight title. He went ahead to win the WBO Africa featherweight title, which he defended successfully once before fighting Filipino John Neil Tabernal in Accra to add the WBC Youth, Silver and WBO Oriental featherweight titles to his modest silverware. Throughout this journey, Dogbe has found a way of warming his way into the hearts of relevant people and the public. Over the period, he has courted massive love from the people of Ghana, reminiscent of the affection that people had for the legendary Azuma Nelson during his active years. The overlord of the Anglo state in the Volta region is the Awomefia Togwi III III, who happens to be a grand uncle of Togwi. He is very passionate about the boxer's return and he has the firm belief that Isaac will deliver. I want to let you know that is my grandson. Secondly, 
He has been he has been able to distinguish himself in a particular way of life. That is in the boxing field. It was no surprise to me that he won the first title. Who is a descendant of warriors. But very unfortunately, in the second session, he lost it. But that does not bring his efforts and victory to an end. A more beyond ahead of him. Now that he's going for the second the defense of his title, I'm assuring you, or I'm telling you confidently that I'm standing firm behind him, both spiritually and materially. And I, I can tell you that he's coming back with the victory. Amen. You know, it's a, it's a very important moment in the life of a young man. Because he has put himself on the map of the world. What I'm trying to say in this context is that his fight is not only known to Ghanaians, but the world all, the world all over. And the honor that he will bring to Ghana were not only meant for his family, Ghanaian, but the world at large. But we, those who are immediately related to him, who take the greater price, uh, greater size of the pride, I'm assuring you, and I'm telling you, that the fight ahead of him is going to conquer his uh, uh, contestant. We will beat him, second round. Amen. Amen. Because we are ever prepared to give him a befitting welcome when he comes back home with the title. Dr. Donald Agumenu is a project consultant, politician, and a member of Dogbe's team at Rising Star Africa Promotions in charge of marketing and brand building. He has been a part of Dogbe's journey. In this dispensation, there are a lot of young bosses. The persona of Isaac Dogbe the charisma of Isaac Dogbe, the kind of aura, the air around him, and the people that want to, to, to have connection with his brand. It's so amazing. I don't want to promote any drink, but permit me to say, if you pick any soft drink in the market and the brands on it, the very day that you clean that brand on it, it's just a black water. The words of that product is that brand that is written on. As Igdogbe emerged out of the blue, emerged through preparation, emerged out of focus, emerged as somebody in search of excellence. When he came out, everybody knew that this is somebody we are waiting for. So to me, the, the loss is, is not really a big deal, but it is a lesson to us as uh, as, as a family, as a country, and for him especially, as somebody who would enter the arena. Because if you've not been able to overcome your, your weaknesses, that is when uh, you would have a fear. But for me, I believe that he's been able to overcome all those setbacks. The Ghana Boxing Authority president was also at ringside when Dogbe won the WBO title. He was right there when Dogbe lost it as well. He expresses great confidence in Dogbe's ability to regain the world title. This was a Mexican. He was a number one contender. You looked at his record, his number of wins and knockouts, and he was even better than Isaacs, you know? And he hadn't lost a fight in some years and had virtually killed his last eight opponents. So you, you couldn't, I mean, toy with an opponent like that. And secondly, Isaac was conceding a lot in height and reach. And with that kind of fight, it wasn't going to be easy. I mean, that kind of opponent, you have to pursue him. And when I say pursue him, you have to smoke him. Like Joe Frieza or Mike Tyson would come at you. It means that you have to be close to him and be working on the body and punching him and preventing him from throwing his jabs and his crosses. And it's very difficult. If you're not well conditioned, you can't do that. I've heard people say, um, two things people are saying, oh, it's, it's too early for him to fight the same opponent again. Why, why, why don't you get him to fight one or two other opponents and then, uh, you know, shake off all the, you know, 
anxieties and fears and then come back stronger. Well, it's, it, it's, it's, it happens more, more often that that is the case, but there are exceptions to that as well. I've seen fighters who have lost their titles come back in, in, you know, in grand fashion and win, them, win their titles back. So it is very possible and I, I can tell from the level of training he's going through and the determination that he's, he's determined to do just that. Then there are people who also say, oh, it's, it's about time his dad, Paul, took a step back and got some more experienced trainers in the corner. That is also a good point, but at the same time, don't forget that it's the same Paul who has taken him from nowhere, from scratch, and taken him to the top. So if, if Paul was able to get him to fight and beat the likes of Magdaleno and others, then I trust that this same Paul will up his game and get his boy back to the very top. Ah!